Brothers and sisters, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Uh, we are continuing in our study of Matthew's gospel this morning. Uh, if you came to church but you didn't make it here with a Bible, there are black Bibles underneath the seat in front of you for your use. You'll find Matthew 25 on page 780, page 780 of that black Bible. Now, friends, this morning we are wrapping up our study of Jesus' final sermon, his last extended teaching before he was crucified. And we call this sermon the Olivet Discourse, since Jesus taught his disciples while sitting on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. And as we've made our way through Jesus' final sermon, we've seen that it has one laser-focused theme. Jesus hones in on his second coming at the end of the age, and specifically how we as his people should prepare ourselves for that last great day of final salvation and judgment. Now, last week, we looked at the middle section of Jesus' teaching in which he emphasized the eternal urgency of being ready for his return. Now, Christ's second coming will usher in the day of the Lord's judgment. And so, Jesus says, we ought to live every day showing that we're prepared for that last great day. Well, in today's text, Jesus ties a bow on, on the sermon. In verses 31 to 46, he lays out this gripping vision of that final judgment, and specifically of the role that he will play on that day as our great king and judge. Remember that he's just got done, Jesus has, showing us through the parable of the talents that the evidence the evidence that we belong in his kingdom is a life of faithfulness with every opportunity and responsibility that he's given us. Well, this last section, it kind of changes gears a little bit. It really deals with the character or the content of that faithful life to which Jesus calls us. So, well, John, what is that content of the faithful life? Jesus reminds us that a faithful disciple is one who loves. Let's turn our attention to verse 31 of chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people from one another as a shepherd uh, separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, again, a a weighty text, isn't it? An awe-inspiring text as we read of the, the final judgment before the throne. But as weighty as it is, as awe-inspiring as it is, I really think the central message of these verses about the final judgment is relatively simple. Jesus says this is the kind of main takeaway of Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Your eternal destiny hangs on your relationship to Jesus. 
And your relationship to Jesus is revealed by your posture toward his people. That's really it. A bit long, but pretty simple, isn't it? Your eternal destiny hangs. It rests all the weight of it on your relationship to Jesus. And your relationship to Jesus is revealed by your posture toward his people. Friends, we're going to look at the text today in two different points. Number one, we're going to fix our gaze on the king who will judge. The king who will judge. And then secondly, we're going to look at the criteria he will use. The king who will judge and the criteria that he will use. Friends, I pray that the Lord would use his word today to sober us and challenge us and encourage us as we prepare to meet King Jesus on that great day. If you're not a Christian, I pray that as we look together at this future judgment that King Jesus himself will execute on the last day, that you would recognize that this same king, this same judge, Jesus, even now holds out his hand of mercy and forgiveness to you before that last day of judgment arrives. And for those of us who are Christians through faith in Christ, I pray that this vision of our, of our king's judgment and the criteria that he will use will spur us on to a, a deeper love for him that overflows in a fervent love for his people. Let's look at the king who will judge. When Jesus begins to describe the final judgment there in verse 31, he wants us to first understand the spectacular glory of the moment. In verse 31, Jesus describes his return as he, the Son of Man, coming in what? In glory with all the angels. And then he kind of double clicks on the glory of it all. Jesus says that the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. Friends, this is a, a truly awesome moment that Jesus describes. On that day, Jesus the King will be exalted. It's no longer going to be a hidden enthronement in heaven. Heaven will have come to earth, and our Christ will be exalted, enthroned in the sight of all. Now, before we know any specifics about this judgment, we ought to be encouraged because Jesus says that on that day, all the nations of the world will be gathered before him. Remember that earlier in this very sermon, Jesus told his disciples that before the end would come, the gospel of the kingdom would be proclaimed throughout what? Throughout all the nations. And now people from all those nations are gathered before the throne. Christ's gospel has succeeded in redeeming people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. I want you to imagine it. Before the glorious throne of the king stands every single human being who has ever walked the planet. By this time, all the dead, those in Christ and those outside of Christ, have been raised to life by God's power to stand before the King. All the living at the time of Jesus' return will, will join them around the throne. Multiple billions of people are gathered before Jesus to be weighed on the eternal scales of His justice. When you picture this scene in your mind, let me ask you, do you see yourself? You ought to. I'll be there. You'll be there. Each of us will stand before Jesus, our righteous judge. You know, people often talk about Christ as if he's just the friendly neighborhood rabbi. He's the good teacher who had lots of, you know, compelling things to say about how to live. His teaching is, is one decent option on the buffet line of religious and philosophical offerings that you can choose from. Take it or leave it. It's up to you. But friends, is that how Jesus talked about himself? Because here he is three days before he would be crucified on a Roman cross, and that is not at all what he's claiming. He is not claiming to be a mere teacher. He's not even merely claiming to be Israel's long-awaited Messiah king. He's claiming to be the very God who will judge the entire world in the end. C.S. Lewis had it right. Jesus is either a wacko religious lunatic or he's an evil liar intentionally trying to deceive people. 
or else he's who he claimed to be. He is the Lord and judge of all. There's really no option for him simply to be a good guy. In verse 31, Jesus paraphrases Zechariah 14.5. Zechariah 14.5, the prophet Zechariah, speaking of the day of judgment, says this, then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. You see what Jesus did? What does he do? In verse 31, he substitutes the title, the Son of Man, for Zacharias, the Lord my God. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him. And what he, Jesus is doing, he is welding together two Old Testament passages. Daniel 7, Daniel's vision of the Son of Man receiving an, an eternal kingdom with Zacharias' prophecy about the Lord coming in judgment. And he's saying, guess what? Both are fulfilled in me. I am the exalted king who is also your God. Again, either Jesus is off his rocker or he's lying to your face or the one talking is God incarnate. Listen to how he put it in John 5, 26. John 5, 26. For as the father has life in himself, so he is granted the son, that is the son of God, also to have life in himself. And he is given authority, he's given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Who does the father authorize to carry out his judgment on the last day? It's Christ Jesus. Jesus is not only the source of our salvation, he is the agent of final judgment. And let me ask you, do you have this type of high, exalted view of King Jesus? It's true that Jesus is the friend of sinners, but he is not your buddy. He's the king of the universe. Yes, he's full of wisdom, but he is not merely a good teacher whose sayings you ought to consider. No, Jesus is the glorious king who even now is enthroned over the universe as God and who will one day judge the world in righteousness. He doesn't merely deserve your admiration. He deserves your worship. Look again at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people from one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right but the goats on his left. Jesus says that in this final judgment, he will do the dividing work of a shepherd. See, in the countryside, sheep and goats grazed together during the day. And from a distance, sheep and goats often looked like each other. But at nighttime, they had to be separated. Sheep, apparently, I am not a shepherd, but sheep apparently can tolerate the cooler air, I suppose because of their wool. But goats must be herded together for warmth. And of course, it was the shepherd's responsibility to, to separate the sheep from the goats. And Jesus is using that very familiar image to the ancient Middle East and saying, that's what I'm going to do at the end of the age as the shepherd king. It's my role to make a clear distinction between the, the sheep, those who will inherit my Father's kingdom by His grace, and the goats, those whose rebellion against God merits His eternal judgment. So in the image, Jesus places the sheep, His true people, on His right at the, at the, the place of eternal honor and glory. And then the goats on His left to be prepared for final punishment. Friends, Jesus could not have presented this division of humanity in starker categories. Sheep and goats, right hand, left hand. The eternal blessing of the Father or His eternal curse. We don't like to talk much about division today, do we? <laughs> uh, division's usually a bad thing. It's a negative thing. Uh, anytime we talk about division, we talk about the need to heal divides, right? To bring people together, not further divide them. Obviously, it's usually a commendable goal. Yet here, Jesus says that he will make a division between humanity at the end of time. And this division will be final. It will be irreversible. It will determine the eternal destiny of every human being. 
said, John, wait a second. Isn't what Jesus is saying kind of exclusive? Well, yeah, but probably not in the way you might think. I heard it put this way a number of years ago. It's an analogy that made sense to me. When when most people hear us Christians talk about the exclusivity of Christianity, they they get the wrong idea. They, They think that we're saying that the world is kind of divided up into different religious and philosophical teams. So so over here, you have the, the Christians, and they've got the, the white jerseys on. And then, you know, over there, you've got the, the Muslims with the black jerseys, and there's the Hindus with the red jerseys. And, and then there's the atheists and agnostics with the multicolored jersey because they couldn't make up their mind about what team they wanted to be on, right? And what happens is that God look, looks down from heaven, and he just kind of arbitrarily picks what team he likes best. And well, we Christians believe that we're the team that God picked to the exclusion of the others. And of course, to people who are steeped in this pluralistic society in which many roads lead to God, that sounds like the height of arrogance, doesn't it? But friends, that is not at all what we Christians believe. What we believe is that we are all, every single one of us, on the same team. We are born on the same team, and our opponent, it was God himself. In our sin, we were born as God's enemies. Because we're all sinners, we, we naturally oppose God. We, we buck his rule over our lives. And, and so what did God do? Well, he could have done away with humanity on the spot. So great was Adam's rebellion that spawned sin in each one of us. That's what human kings do, don't they? There's an uprising against a human king. What does he do? He crushes it. He puts it down. He executes the traitors on the spot. That's what we deserve. But that is not what our God did. Instead of bringing down a torrent of immediate judgment, our God responded with overflowing mercy and grace. He put in motion his eternal plan to send his son, our king, to rescue us to forgive us and and pardon us and make us a new people created in his image. That's why Jesus came. He came to save us and restore us to a relationship with God that brings us into the eternal life that he created for us. So if you're not a Christian, I, I hope that today will be the day that you understand, maybe for the first time, that the king's hand, Christ Jesus's hand, that hand of mercy is open to you. But guess what? You have to act on it. You have to reach out and clasp Christ's hand in yours, as it were, and bow your heart and life to him. You have to say, Lord Jesus, you're my king. My my heart is yours. I believe that you rose or that you lived and died and rose again for my sin. I am following you with my life. So is Christianity exclusive? Well, yes, it is but it's exclusive for those who accept the king's hand of mercy because Jesus is the way of salvation that God has mercifully provided to sinners like us. Jesus is saying that there are only two possible outcomes for you on the last day. See that? Either you'll be among the sheep by faith in King Jesus or you'll be among the goats. And Jesus doesn't give us a third option as we might like to think he does. And there's no middle category for those who are really friendly to Jesus, but haven't yet declared their allegiance to him. Maybe that's you this morning. In in your mind, you'll be okay on judgment day because you're really cozy with Christ. You you study things about Jesus. You you come to church regularly and have been for years. Uh, You you do Christian-y things Maybe you've been weighing Christianity intellectually for several years, and yet you're still on the fence. Friends, if that's you, so glad you're here, but you need to square with this image that Jesus gives us. Because there aren't sheepy goats on the last day, are there? There's no third category of people who are friendly to the king, but don't follow him. You're either a sheep or a goat. You either belong to Jesus by faith or you don't. And I pray that today you'll realize that eternity does hang in the balance. 
It's time to jump off the fence. It's time to, to lay down even your intellectual objections that you use to run cover for your pride. Lay those things down at the king's feet and just say, you know what? I may not have every conclusion worked out in my mind yet, but I know one thing. Jesus is who he claimed to be. Jesus is God. And not only that, he's my God. He's my king. I'm going to rest in his work to save me. One of the things that those who know me well make fun of me for is that I am a fan of multiple sports teams. Uh, Sometimes multiple sports teams in the same sport, okay? So um, people mock me for cheering for Kansas basketball and Alabama and Kansas football. They say, why would you do that? And I have one very simple answer for them. That's called marriage survival, amen, right? Uh, They make fun of me. Uh, They used to for being both a Kansas City Chiefs fan, which you know about, and a Dallas Cowboys fan, which I don't claim to be so much anymore. Uh, I was born in Dallas. All my wife's, or my, all my mom's family is from Dallas. Uh, I lived there for seven years, but grew up mostly in Kansas City. And so for years, I claimed to be both a Cowboys fan and a Chiefs fan. And my friends just used to, to mock me for that. Even into my adult life, we would be watching Sunday night football after church, and they would be like, oh, which of these teams is your team tonight, John? And I just grew so sick of that type of mockery. And finally, one day, several years ago, I realized, you know what? I'm not really a Cowboys fan. I don't love the Cowboys. I couldn't name for you all that many players on the Cowboys roster where I could name you from memory all the Chiefs players. You know, I'm not looking up articles about the Cowboys. I'm not following their beat writers on Twitter like I do the Chiefs. I love the Chiefs. I'm a Chiefs fan. And, and by the way, this was before the Patrick Mahomes Super Bowl era, okay? I am not a bandwagon fan. All of a sudden, I came to a settled resolution in my mind. I'm with the Chiefs. Because that's what some of you need to do today in relation to Christianity, in relation to Jesus. You simply let your heart move toward him. You turn from your sin and you say, you know what? I'm with the king. He died for me. He rose again. I'm with him. And then you follow him with your life. Notice this passage not only speaks of a sharp divide between humanity, but of a wide divide as well. A wide divide. Jesus says in verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But then look at verse 41. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. On the one hand, God in his grace has prepared an eternal kingdom for his people. It's an eternity of of blessing and the fullest joy and satisfaction you could possibly conceive of. God is the source of life and we will forever be with him. But on the other hand, those who don't come to God through his son are sent into the eternal fire prepared for, this, for, for the devil, for Satan and the fallen angels. It is a cursed place of eternal condemnation and torment. Instead of the invitation come given to those on the right, those sent to the left of the Son of Man hear the most awful words ever spoken. The part from me. I think the natural instinct of most people when they read of the eternal conscious punishment of hell is to soft pedal it, to kind of assuage their conscience. Oh, surely it can't be that bad. Surely Jesus is speaking in a metaphor here when he talks about the eternal fire. After all, the Jews would have known well about the fires of Gehenna where Trash and refuse were perpetually burned outside Jerusalem. Okay, well, even if it's true that, that hell or Gehenna is a, is a metaphor for judgment, and, and I'm not sure that it is, surely the reality of hell isn't better than the image of physical fire. Surely it's far worse. 
It's a separation from God under his condemnation so horrific that the only suffering you could compare it with is the ferocity and heat and destructive force and fearfulness of a fire that will burn for eternity. Yes, in eternity. Jesus says that those on the left are cast into an eternal fire. In other places, Jesus describes this punishment as not only eternal, but conscious. The experience of it is conscious for eternity. I don't have time this morning to give a full apologetic for the reality of eternal hell, but let me just say this about hell. Every single human being craves for justice. We want horrific wrongs like abuse and murder and genocide to be dealt with. If hell doesn't exist, friends, well, then neither does God. Because he would be a God who looks the other way at evil and sweeps it under the rug without any consequence. He would be a God who sees atrocities and injustices of humanity and do nothing. But God reveals himself as a God of perfect justice who will bring about perfect retribution and vindication. He says that he will right all wrongs one day far more precisely and justly than we could ever hope to do. The problem is that we love the idea of justice for things done against us. But we loathe the idea of justice for things done by us. And the truth is that each one of us has offended our infinitely good and holy God, as we sang about this morning. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans, all have sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's not that you're as bad as you could possibly be. It's that any sin from from the little white lie to the most heinous crime is an act of cosmic treason against our God. It's an offense worthy of infinite judgment because it's offended an infinitely holy God. That's why eternal hell makes sense because if sin goes unpunished, God ceases to be good, and therefore he ceases to be God. And we tend to think that the default destiny of all people is heaven, and, and hell is reserved for the particularly wicked. But in truth, friends, our, our default destiny as human beings is hell, and heaven is reserved for those who have the honesty to admit it and to look to Christ to save them from it. You see, what should astonish us is not that there's a place of eternal justice. What should stun us is not that there's only one way to get to heaven. What should astonish us is that there is any way to get to heaven for wretched, miserable sinners like you and me. What should cause our hearts to erupt in praise and worship this morning is that hell can be avoided because Jesus on the cross took God's judgment sinners like us. He stood in our place. On the cross, our eternal hell was poured out upon our Christ so that God's eternal mercy and grace might be poured out upon us. Jesus took the eternal death for all who would trust in him so that we, by faith, might receive his eternal life. Friend, if you're not a Christian, you want to know more about this good news, the saving message of Jesus more about how you can have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. Grab me afterward. Grab Bo, who who prayed earlier. Grab one of our church members who maybe brought you to church this morning and say, please tell me more. I want to follow Jesus with my life. The king who will judge. Number two, the criteria he will use. The fact that Christ will judge is clear enough. But what's the criteria that King Jesus will use on Judgment Day to divide the sheep from the goats? What's going to be the public visible evidence that he uses as grounds for his decision? Jesus says, essentially, it all hinges on how you treat me. Look again at verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, 
Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. In other words, Jesus says the criteria for receiving eternal life is, is that the sheep, the, the king's true people, received him. And that's what all those actions indicate his people did, giving him food and drink and welcoming him and clothing him and visiting him in his time of need. Well, that's the clear evidence that they've received the king. They've demonstrated their love for him. And according to verse 37, the king's commendation of the righteous puzzles them, right? They, they couldn't think of a time when they treated the, Jesus this way. After all, the, the vast majority of believers will enter the kingdom having never met Jesus physically in person, right? And so they asked Jesus, well, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Friends, the surprise of the righteous when, when Christ commended them for their acts of kindness to him, well, that surprise lets me know that what Jesus is about to say in answer to their question cannot be about the things they did to achieve or to merit salvation. They didn't serve the least of these in order to be accepted by the king, did they? No, they did these acts of kindness simply because they wanted to. Their hearts were given over in love to the king, and that love spilled over unconsciously without pretense in love for others. Their love for the least of these is evidence that Jesus' people truly belong to him by his grace. Remember, the righteous are the ones whom Jesus says in verse 34, inherit the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. In other words, their entrance into the kingdom is all of grace. It is all by sheer sovereign mercy, not through anything that they've done to earn it. But Jesus says, you have done things that evidence the fact that you're mine. The righteous ask Jesus, when did we ever receive you and welcome you and help you in your time of need? Well, look at verse 40. Verse 40, and the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Now, unfortunately, some people have used Jesus' statement here to say something that he's not saying. They use verse 40 as a, an appeal toward mercy ministry to the poor and needy generically, or as a basis to, for instance, end world hunger, or establish ministries like orphanages and prison ministries and special needs ministries and so on. This is a ministry to the least of these. It's anyone we encounter who's, who is needy. And of course, we Christians ought to be marked, shouldn't we, by mercy to outsiders. We ought to be the first in line to help with physical needs of those around us in our communities. I mean, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan tells us that. We ought to let the light of Christ shine through our good deeds. But is Jesus here talking about generic mercy to the, the poor and needy? He's not. He's not. And, and there's two big clues right in the text that help us understand that. First of all, look at, look at the text, verse 40, right? Jesus commends acts of kindness to the least of these. That descriptor, least, is the superlative of another adjective that Jesus uses throughout the Gospels when he talks about how people treat his little ones. It's the same word. If you want to translate it this way, you could. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the littlest of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Well, guess who Jesus is referring to every single time in Matthew that he talks about the little ones? He's talking about his disciples, about his followers, about his people. And of course, there's a more obvious giveaway, isn't there, in the text that Jesus is referring not just to the, the least in society in general. He says, this kindness is done to the least of these, my brothers. He speaks about those with whom he has a family relationship. What did Jesus say back in Matthew 12? Who was my mother and my brothers? 
And stretching out his hand toward the disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and my brother and my sister. You see what Jesus is saying to the righteous? By receiving and welcoming and treating with compassion the least among my disciples, you've done that to me. Friends, there is a gospel thread running through Jesus' statement that ought to electrify your hearts today if you're a believer in Christ. Because how in the world can acts of love done to the least of Jesus' brothers be counted as having been done to him? How does that even work? Well, apparently, Jesus has so identified himself with his people by grace that we are inextricably bound to him. It's why in God's amazing grace, Jesus' righteous life is counted to sinners like you and me as if we lived it. He's identified himself eternally with us. It's why his death on the cross results in our death to sin. It's why his rising from the dead on the third day means that you and I live each day in the power of his resurrection with his resurrection life coursing through our spiritual veins and why we can be confident that we will too will rise from the dust on the last day when Christ calls our name. Jesus has attached himself to us in an intimate and vital way so that what is true of Jesus is true of you. And apparently it works the other way too. Jesus loves his people so much that the way they're treated, well, that's how he's treated. When people align themselves to Christ's people and love, it's proof that they've aligned themselves to him. You remember what the ascended Christ said to Tall of, of, uh, uh, Tall. Did I just say that? Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Is that what he said? Oh, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? How had Saul persecuted Christ? (laughs) Saul wasn't on his way to the throne room of heaven to see Christ and persecute him. He was headed to Damascus to persecute believers. It's the same principle Jesus is getting at here. Our king has so identified himself with us by his grace that what becomes of us reflects on him. To persecute Christ's people is to persecute Christ himself. To love Christ's people is to love Christ himself. It is incredible. Beloved, the primary evidence that Jesus points us to, the primary evidence of genuine discipleship to King Jesus is love for your fellow disciples. And of course, the converse is true as well. Well, what does Jesus say is the criteria for his future judgment of the unrighteous that he places on the left? Well, it's the mirror opposite of what he just said to the righteous, right? You didn't receive me. You didn't welcome me. You didn't help me in my time of need. You don't love me. And you know how I know that you don't love me? Because you don't love the least among my brothers and sisters. Friends, surely if the unrighteous on Jesus' left knew this criteria, they would have treated uh, Jesus' people with, with kindness and compassion, right? They would have aligned themselves with the church to align themselves with him. But friends, what King Jesus will hold out as the public evidence of your qualification to receive eternal life is not a type of a performative love that you do merely to avoid judgment but genuine selfless love expressed fervently from the heart. If I could just go back to the sheep and goats analogy real quick. Jesus isn't saying that the the difference between the sheep and the goats is the way their wool looks. He's not saying the only difference between the righteous and the unrighteous is what they did or didn't do. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about something far deeper and far more fundamental than that. He's saying that the that the difference between the sheep and the goats is their DNA. And the difference is at the cellular level of who they really and truly are. They're just a different species altogether. 
And of course, there are external differences between sheep and goats that help us distinguish between the two. We can examine the fruit of someone's life and discern much about their spiritual condition, can't we? But we need to be careful not to confuse the, the fruit with the root. We shouldn't confuse the wool with the DNA. The New Testament is consistent. The way we love others has eternal significance. I mean, Jesus clearly says the righteous will be separated from the the unrighteous based on the presence of real love for others. It shows their real love for him. However, however, this sacrificial love for the littlest ones is not the cause of a righteous new nature. It's not the cause of a new nature. It is the inevitable fruit of having received a new nature. Having real wool, friends, does not make you a sheep. Being a sheep causes you to have real wool. Listen how Peter put it in 1 Peter 1.22. 1 Peter 1.22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and embodied word of God. In other words, the inevitable byproduct of God's transforming grace in your life is love for his people. True faith in Christ works itself out in sacrificial love for others and particularly in sacrificial love for Christ's brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in Christ. What did Paul write in Galatians 6.10? As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those among the household of faith. Of course, the rest of the New Testament, friends, explains that the primary context for this type of sacrificial love, the primary context for this type of sacrificial love is the local church. It's not that we shouldn't or, or, or can't love Christians everywhere. Obviously, we we should and we can. It's why we pray for the the good of the gospel through other local churches and good Christian organizations, right? And it's why we pray for for Christians here in Arizona and around the world, just like we did this morning. It's why we sometimes intercede for persecuted brothers and sisters around the world and even mobilize help to get to them. Of course, we love all Christians, but the first and normal context that Christ expects this type of sacrificial love to bloom is within committed relationships within the church. It's why the Apostle Paul, that same Saul that encountered Christ on the Damascus Road, explained relationships within the local church in terms of being a member of the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Do you think that Paul just kind of invented that metaphor? No, he got it from Jesus on the road to Damascus at his conversion. So inextricably linked are God's people to our Savior and King that Paul says we're his very body. To love the body is to love Christ. To harm the body is to harm Christ. Paul wrote to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 12, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You're all body parts, members of of Christ's body that work for the spiritual good of the whole body and of, of the individual members. Friends, surely you didn't think we got this idea of, of, of church membership from your local gym, right? Or from Costco, where you pay for goods and services that are rendered to you. It, it, no, that's not at all what it is. It is from 1 Corinthians 12. It is about this type of committed sacrificial love that Jesus has called us to as Christians. In fact, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 12, just for a moment. It's over on page 902, I believe. 1 Corinthians 12. Turn there for a second. Let's read what Paul says about how members of the body treat each other. And tell me if it doesn't echo just a bit Jesus' is teaching about the least of these among the people of God. Okay, 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to jump into Paul's conversation midstream. Okay, look at verse 19. Paul writes, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the 
again, the heads of the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Here it is. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Beloved, this is Christianity 101. I don't know how you regularly sacrifice for one another, for other Christians, without ongoing commitment to other Christians. It's what membership in the local church, this local expression of Christ's body is all about. We love one another as an expression of our love for Christ. We identify with one another in our suffering and in our rejoicing because Christ identifies himself with us. We do it out of love for him. Brothers and sisters, I just want to commend you that I see evidence of this type of gritty, self-giving love all the time here within the body at RGC. Whether it's responses to meal train emails for those who are sick and grieving, or responding to calls to help an elderly brother or sister with a, with a house project, or, or springing into action when a member has an acute trial in their life. Friends, in many ways, you are an exemplary group of believers when it comes to sacrificing for the least of these. And I think that entails need and suffering, the least of these within the body, within the family of God. But let me ask you, how does King Jesus want his word to impact your life today? Who are the least of your brothers and sisters that Christ Jesus is calling you to love? Let's be honest, some believers are easier to love than others, even for pastors. But just because love is hard doesn't mean that we, we skirt around that person to move on to someone who's easier for us. In a real sense, easy love might be cheap love. Authentic love is proven when it's tough, when it's difficult, when it costs you something when it requires sacrifice. It's the type of love that Jesus exemplified when he loved us even to death. Friends, who are the least among the family of God that have a, a real need that you could meet? Are, are you even looking for those type of opportunities on a regular basis? Do you come on the Lord's day committing to be here with a ministry of presence, yes, but even more than that, having your spiritual antenna up, as it were, looking for the needy around you, looking for the lonely and the hurting among the body. You know, in a, in a church family, I mean, we're, we're not a huge church. I don't even know if I'd call us a mid-sized church yet. I don't know, 153 members, 100, something like that. I mean, it's difficult to think about caring for everyone. But I think what we as the elders would have you to, to focus on is, first of all, think about meeting needs within your circles of relationships within the church. Think about your house-to-house -house group. And think about those on your serving team. And think about those who you always sit by, because I know you have your spots. Think about those who you normally sit by on Sunday morning. How can you care well for them. You know, so much of this conversation, it's about priorities, isn't it? It's, a, it's about making conscious decisions with your life about things like your money. Am I going to spend all my money on myself? Or am I going to cut some things out so I have a little left over so that if a need of the body arrives, I can spring into generosity? It's about making decisions with your time. You know, I'm not always going to have to be on the go. I'm not always going to have to be doing that, that entertainment thing or taking that vacation. You know what? I'm going I'm to keep some time blocks in my schedule that will allow me to intentionally serve the least of my brothers and sisters. 
Maybe it looks like reading, a, a, reading the Bible with a struggling Christian. Maybe it looks like listening on the phone to the brother or sister who's in a really hard marriage. Maybe it looks like serving in the nursery where you truly serve the little ones. But more importantly, you come alongside parents who are just flat out worn out and you serve their kids in love so that they might hear the gospel, listen to the sound of the word of God in an undistracted way and not wear out all the other kids workers who are serving Sunday after Sunday. You share the load with them. You serve the least of these. Friends, I would encourage you, maybe one way to apply this is to go back to the book table and pick up the book for like eight bucks. Love the ones who drive you crazy. Eight truths for pursuing unity in your church. Maybe a way that you can foster this type of love is to pick up this little book and try to put it into practice. If you profess to be a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, but you're not, you're not living in committed sacrificial relationships within the context of the local church. Well, friend, I, will, I hope that you'll let Christ's word settle on your conscience this morning. If you call yourself a Christian, but your life bears no tangible evidence of love for Christ's people within the church, if you refuse to commit yourself in love to the good of the body, well, friend, I'm not sure that Jesus would want you to be confident that you'll be included on the last day on his right among the sheep. None of us can see the root. We can only see the fruit. We can't see the heart. All we can see is the evidence of the heart's transformation by grace. But Jesus, he sees both. On the last day, Jesus says, I'm going to consult the fruit to verify the root. It's clear, genuine love for others that evidence your love for me. Love for me overflows and love for the least of these, my brothers and sisters. Your eternal destiny hangs on your relationship to Jesus. And your relationship to Jesus is revealed by your posture toward his people. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you that you have loved us enough to give us a hard word like this. The proof of your mercy and grace extended to humanity is that Jesus even talked about the last judgment like this and warned us about it and encouraged us with it. Oh, Father, we thank you for sending your son to live and die and rise again in our place. We thank you that we don't have to fear the judgment through your love in your son. But Lord, we know that the evidence of whether we love Christ is our love for his people. And so we just ask that you might use your word today to, to motivate us, to spring us into action, to cause us to remember how much you love us and that we would respond to your love with love for Christ that then just spills out in all types of creative ways that we love others, that we love each other, even within the body of Christ today and this week. Oh, Father, use your spirit among us to create this type of atmosphere that just overflows in love here at Redeeming Grace Church. We ask in Christ's name, amen.